We know that Richard's remains are likely to lie in the remains of the Greyfriars. In this case, by looking at the DNA of living individuals and comparing that. And we find skeletal remains of somebody that look like it could be him. The lab results came in and the scientists couldn't believe their eyes. They had the skeleton of King Richard III lost for centuries and the DNA was a perfect match on his mother's side. But on his father's side, the royal male bloodline, there was a shocking break. This wasn't just a quirky finding, it was a historical earthquake. This genetic mismatch suggests a secret affair somewhere in the royal family tree, a secret so big it could mean some of England's most famous kings were never the rightful heirs to the throne. Bloodline Betrayal. The story of how this happened is, to put it mildly, incredible. Professor Turi King, who led the project, collected DNA from five men alive today, all direct descendants of Henry Somerset, the fifth Duke of Beaufort. In theory, every single one of them should have carried the same Y chromosome as Richard III. That one strand of DNA was supposed to be the final ironclad proof linking the bones from under a parking lot to the long lost king. But things are not always what they seem. The result wasn't a neat confirmation. It was a genetic puzzle that cracked open centuries old questions about royal bloodlines and hidden secrets. Not a single one of the five men matched Richard's DNA. The most shocking fact is that four of them belong to a common genetic group known as R1B-U152, while Richard's remains revealed something much rarer, haplogroup G-P287. It was a complete and total mismatch. This immediately raised a startling possibility. Somewhere along the 19 generations separating Richard from the modern day descendants, a false paternity event had occurred. This clinical sounding term means something very simple and very scandalous. The man listed as the father in the family tree was not the biological father. Now many people are crazy about ancestry, but the thing nobody tells you is how often these breaks can happen. Researchers estimate that in past generations, the rate of false paternity was somewhere between one and 2% per generation. When you stretch that over 19 generations, the chances of at least one break in the chain are surprisingly high around 16%. It was not just possible, it was plausible. To make things even wilder, one of the five living relatives tested belonged to a completely different group. M170, which suggested another break, had happened even more recently within the last four generations. The royal family tree was looking less like a straight line and more like a tangled vine. The implications of this discovery sent shockwaves through the halls of history. If this genetic break happened somewhere in the five generations between King Edward III and Richard III, it would throw the legitimacy of the entire English crown into question. For example, if the break occurred between Edward III and his son, John of Gaunt, then the entire Lancaster line would be illegitimate. This wouldn't just affect Henry IV, but also his celebrated son, Henry V, and his grandson, Henry VI. What many overlooked is that this would even shake the foundation of the Tudor dynasty, whose claim to the throne relied partly on their descent from that same John of Gaunt. Could some of England's most famous monarchs have had no legal right to rule? It was a mind-blowing thought, a historical what-if of epic proportions. As one professor noted, solving one historical puzzle had just opened up another, even deeper mystery. This wasn't just a story about a king, it was a story about how fragile identity, inheritance, and power truly are. But if the male line was broken, a new question emerged. Could the Tudor dynasty be a complete fraud? A throne built on lies. The DNA results from Richard III's remains did more than just solve a mystery. They created a firestorm of questions that reached the very heart of the British monarchy. When the world learned that Richard's Y chromosome didn't match his living male relatives, people immediately started connecting the dots. The biggest question of all was about the Tudors. Henry Tudor, who took the crown from Richard at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485 and became King Henry VII, built his entire reign on a supposed blood link to King Edward III. But if the DNA showed a break in that very lineage, it cast a dark shadow over his right to the throne. You see, this meant the entire Tudor dynasty, one of the most famous in history, might have been built on shaky ground. To understand why this is such a big deal, you have to look at the royal family tree. Both Richard III and Henry Tudor traced their ancestry back to King Edward III, but through different sons. 
Henry's claim came through his mother, Margaret Beaufort, who was a descendant of John of Gaunt, one of Edward III's sons. This seemed clear enough on paper, but the DNA results threw a wrench in the works. If that genetic break happened between Edward III and John of Gaunt, it would mean John of Gaunt wasn't the king's biological son. And if that were true, the entire Lancastrian line, including kings Henry IV, V, and VI, would be illegitimate. The most shocking fact is that this isn't just some modern-day conspiracy theory. Whispers and rumors about John of Gaunt's parentage haunted him during his own lifetime over 600 years ago. The gossip was that King Edward III was away on a military campaign when Gaunt was born, leading to doubts about Queen Philippa's faithfulness. An even crueler story claimed that Gaunt was actually the son of a Flemish butcher secretly swapped into the royal cradle after the queen's real child, a daughter, passed away shortly after birth. John of Gaunt was reportedly furious about these rumors, but now, centuries later, modern science has breathed new life into them. Were they just nasty rumors meant to damage his reputation, or was there a kernel of truth to them all along? What many overlooked is that Henry VII himself seemed to know his claim was weak. He didn't rely solely on his bloodline to justify his rule. Instead, after winning the Battle of Bosworth, he boldly declared that he ruled by right of conquest. This was a power move. Taking the crown on the battlefield gave him authority, but not necessarily legitimacy. To seal the deal and end the long-running Wars of the Roses, he made a brilliant political move. He married Elizabeth of York, Richard III's niece. This marriage united the rival houses of Lancaster and York, creating the new Tudor dynasty and giving it a much stronger appearance of legitimacy. Still, the question remains, if he hadn't won the battle, would his bloodline claim ever have been enough? Historians will tell you that the monarchy has never been just about blood. It's a messy mix of opportunity, timing, politics, and pure chance. The crown has passed through so many twists and turns that a pure father-to-son lineage has rarely been the only factor. And you can see this everywhere in history. The current royal family's succession is not affected by these ancient genetic revelations. But the discovery forces us to look at history differently. The Tudor dynasty, which reshaped England forever, might have been founded not by rightful heirs, but by clever and lucky survivors of chaos. So a king's bones told a shocking story, but was there any way to prove they were even his? The final piece of the puzzle. While the Y chromosome tests unleashed a storm of controversy, another type of DNA provided the final undeniable proof that the skeleton was Richard III. This was the key that locked his identity in place with a mind-blowing 99.999% certainty. The secret wasn't in the paternal line, but the maternal one. This part of the story centers on Richard's older sister, Anne of York, and a type of genetic material that passes unchanged from mother to child through generations. Mitochondrial DNA, or mtDNA. The thing nobody tells you about mtDNA is how incredibly reliable it is. Unlike the Y chromosome, which only passes from father to son, mtDNA passes from a mother to all her children, but only her daughters can pass it on to the next generation. This creates an unbroken female line that stretches back through time like a golden thread. In this case, that thread led directly from Anne of York all the way down to two living people a Canadian-born furniture maker living in London named Michael Ibsen, and a second relative from Australia named Wendy Doldick. They were 14th cousins, twice removed, incredibly distant relatives who had no idea they carried a direct link to one of England's most notorious kings. When the scientists compared the mitochondrial DNA from the skeleton to Michael Ibsen's, the result was astonishing. It was a perfect match. Wendy Doldig's DNA showed just a single tiny difference, a variation that scientists said was perfectly normal over so many generations. If anything, that small change made the evidence even stronger as it showed a natural tiny mutation over a vast span of time. This was the smoking gun. You see, Métis DNA has huge advantages for ancient remains. Every cell in your body has thousands of copies of it, making it much more likely to survive for 500 years buried under the earth compared to regular DNA. What many overlooked is the human element here. While the paternal line can be clouded by false paternity events, the maternal line is almost always certain. 
a mother knows who her child is. This makes mtDNA an incredibly powerful tool for confirming identity across centuries. When the scientists crunch the numbers, the probability that these remains belong to anyone other than Richard III was astronomically low. To be absolutely sure, they compared the king's unique mtDNA profile against a database of over 26,000 European DNA sequences. Not a single one matched. The odds of a random match were less than 1 in 10,000. But the DNA was just one piece of the puzzle. Everything else lined up perfectly. The skeleton showed severe scoliosis, a curvature of the spine which matches historical accounts of Richard's appearance. The bones also bore the marks of a violent end, including multiple head injuries consistent with his demise at the Battle of Bosworth. The age of the skeleton at the time of its end, early 30s, also matched Richard's age perfectly. Could all of this be a coincidence? The chances were virtually zero. When you put the DNA evidence, the archaeological context, and the historical records together, the case was closed beyond any reasonable doubt. For over 500 years, Richard III was just a name in a history book, his body lost to time. Now, science had given him his name back. With the king's identity confirmed, his DNA began to tell a story about the man himself. History's Greatest Makeover with the skeleton confirmed as Richard III, scientists could finally look past the myths and see the man. For centuries, our image of him was shaped by Tudor propaganda and Shakespeare's unforgettable villain, a monstrous, deformed tyrant. But his bones and DNA tell a very different and far more human story. People are watching this looking for a mystery and they found one, but the real story is about how easily history can be twisted. The thing is, are we missing a key detail? Is it possible all this happened overnight? The truth is far more complex. First, let's talk about the famous hunchback. The skeleton revealed that Richard did have severe scoliosis, which developed after he was 10 years old. This would have caused his spine to curve sideways, making one shoulder, likely his right, noticeably higher than the other. This detail actually matches some descriptions from his own time. But what many overlooked is that this condition did not make him weak or frail. His body was strong and fit, fully capable of wearing heavy armor and fighting on a battlefield. The idea of him as a twisted, feeble creature was a gross exaggeration, a political caricature designed to make him seem unnatural and unfit to rule. The most shocking fact is what the bones didn't show. There was no sign of a withered arm, no trace of the grotesque deformities Shakespeare wrote about. The skeleton was that of a man who, despite his uneven shoulders, was physically capable. This discovery single-handedly dismantles centuries of myth-making. It forces you to ask, why did his enemies, the Tudors, go to such lengths to paint him as a monster? The answer is simple. Politics. By making Richard seem evil and physically malformed, they could present Henry VII as a heroic savior who was destined to take the throne. It was a brilliant and ruthless smear campaign. The genetic analysis went even deeper, revealing what Richard III actually looked like. The DNA showed with 96% certainty that he had blue eyes and with 77% certainty that he had blonde hair, at least as a child, which likely darkened as he got older. Now compare that to the famous portraits of him, most of which were painted long after his demise. They almost always show a dark-haired, brooding man with a menacing expression. Those portraits weren't trying to capture his real appearance, they were reinforcing the Tudor narrative of a dark, villainous king. Science has now given us a glimpse of the real person, a fair-haired, blue-eyed man whose physical reality was deliberately distorted by his rivals. So history was rewritten by a skeleton in a parking lot. Does this mean our history books are filled with lies? Let us know what you think below and don't forget to like and subscribe.